Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Chris Smith. I'm the executive director of the Parity for Main Street Employers Coalition, which is made up of over 100 organizations representing individually and family-owned businesses all across America. And I want to welcome you uh, today to our, our briefing on the impact of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act on all of those businesses and about what comes next. And if you haven't gotten lunch yet, there's, there's a nice lunch over there um, for all our guests. Um, the first filing season under TCJA just concluded, and for all the tax professionals out there, uh, October 15th is the new April 15th because, because of the, the you know, get, getting the, the learning curve of, of learning the new law, uh, so many people had to file extensions, including myself. Um, but uh, Treasury and the IRS uh, are, are due a lot of uh, accommodation because of just the her Herculean effort to get the rules out and the guidance out so that people could comply in the law and, and file their tax returns on time. So we, we are very much appreciative of that. Today we want to explore the impact of, of the new law, especially on individually and family owned businesses. Did they achieve parity with the big tax cut for the large C-Corps? That's a big question for us and we're, we'll get some new, uh, very detailed data on that question. While the ink on the regs is barely dry though, uh, already we see movement proposals, major proposals uh, to go in different directions. Proposals for a 70% tax rate, mark to market on, on capital gains, new wealth taxes. So what happens next is already a question. And uh, especially, how does the public feel about what happened? What, what's the public mood? on this question of how should we tax business. So we want to explore all these, all these issues. Um, first, before we get to our, our panel discussion and introduce those participants, uh, we have our keynote speaker, uh, Senator Daines, who very generously is uh, going to spend his time with us here and share his thoughts. Senator, you were incredibly uh, influential in bringing about uh, such a good result in the legislation uh, for family businesses, and we appreciate your, all your efforts in, in that regard, and we thank you for your leadership. And now, uh, you're leading again with legislation to make these tax cuts permanent. Uh, so we look forward to hearing your thoughts on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the path forward. So, Senator, the floor is yours. Chris, thank you, and uh, where's Brian Reardon at? There he is. Brian, thank you as well for putting this together and being such a great ally when we were having that huge battle back in 17. Uh, it was uh, going to the mat. In fact, just a quick story about that. And, and I, I spent 20 years in the private sector before getting involved in politics. I worked for a Fortune 50 company, Procter & Gamble, so a C-Corps. I, uh, we had family uh, S-Cores, LLCs, so I, I've, uh, and, then, and then another c core when we took a cloud computing company public and, and then sold to Oracle. So I've, I've been in C-Cores, been in pass-throughs, and when this debate started about taking rates down from 35% on the C-Core side down to, I would have liked to say 15%, but we settled at 21. As this debate was ongoing, uh, we kept asking the question, well, what's going on on the pass-through side? That had to be discussed and confronted. And by the way, with a 5149 U.S. Senate, all it took were a couple of us to decide that pastors were important and, uh, and you had some leverage in the discussion. I remember President Trump calling me from Air Force One. I was putting a, the star on our Christmas tree with my wife. I was up on the ladder and I saw my phone ringing and you kind of know when, it, when in the there's a certain way it looks sometimes when you get that call. I said, I think I better take this as either the vice president or the president most likely. I picked it up, it was the president. He was flying, I said it was the, the uh, Air Force One switchboard. I said, yes, I'm available to speak to the president. And I said, Mr. President, here's why I think we need to have tax relief for pass-throughs for small businesses, Main Street businesses. Most of the jobs are created by pass-throughs more than C-Course. So if, if this tax reform is a means to an end, the means is lowering taxes, the end is economic growth and job creation. If we're not addressing the pass-throughs, then we have not really addressed the, the heart of what needs to happen here to achieve that end. 
So I said, Mr. President, this is really good policy, first of all. And by the way, in a state like Montana, over 70% of our jobs are through the pass-through side, not through C-Course. And when you t take a look at economic growth, typically it's the pastors who lead that more so than the C course. So I made that case, I said, it's very good policy, but it's also really good politics, taking care of smaller businesses. And he listened and said, uh, well, that makes a lot of sense. I said, well, that's why Senator Johnson and I are, are making a big deal about this. We think this is the right thing to do for the, this, this legislation. And, and truly, Brian, thanks for your many hours of counsel to our team and myself personally as we were going through that process. Because we were using the, the information you all were helping us with to help sell the case, to make sure that was kept in the legislation and then we got it across the finish line. We'll be two years in December when, since we passed this legislation. And to tell you, I, uh, I can't just imagine when we, when we go out there and talk, spend time across Montana talking about lowest unemployment rates for women, for African Americans, for Hispanics, for youth, starting to see the increase in middle class wages. It is wonderful to see what's happened here because of what we did. We're starting to see these outcomes and those policies. I remember when I was presiding over the Senate a couple of different times during that debate on the tax code and listening to some of my colleagues from across the aisle who were you know, berating us for doing this. And uh, one thing, if you, if you go back and replay those tapes, some of those speeches given, you probably ought to do that. Because I was sitting there listening, and I thought, you know, both sides can't be right. This is a very quantitative outcome. I wonder what will happen in two years. Because I'm pretty confident we're going to see economic growth in higher wages and lower unemployment. And that's exactly what's happened as a result of these tax cuts. Whether you go back to Kennedy, you go to Reagan, and now to Trump, it's a it's a well-known formula. Cut rates, grow the economy, increase wages. 6.4 million new jobs. This 3.5% unemployment rate. Did anybody think we'd get back to 3.5%? I don't think many thought we could do that. And yet, we have done that. I just got off of a Fox Business here about 30 minutes ago, just around the corner here with Stuart Varney talking about what's going on with these trade deals. I was in China uh, five weeks ago, meeting with Vice Premier Liu He. Some of you know I spent five and a half years working in China when I was with Procter & Gamble. In fact, our two youngest kids were born in Hong Kong. So we've had a lot of time experience working over there. In fact, when I was in the cloud computing business, I ran Asia Pacific the last five years. I had an office in Tokyo, one in Sydney, looking at, you know, again, global operations, global competitiveness. We absolutely had to get our tax rates down. With that, because if we didn't, you, we know what's going on here in terms of jobs leaving this country, businesses leaving our country. Let me just say this. This is an exciting time in our country. I know we've got impeachment obsession going on right now on Capitol Hill. It's unfortunate because there's so many good things going on right now. They're being drowned out by this impeachment obsession. That Japan trade deal the president signed was a really, really big deal. I flew back from Montana for that deal, stood next to the president as uh, when Lighthizer and the Japanese ambassador signed it. That's a really big deal. You look at our top four trading partners. Number one's China, two Mexico, three Canada, four Japan. So we just took the Japan deal off the table, basically took most of the TPP provisions, forklift them out and dropped them in a bilateral with Japan. USMCA is ready to go. That's what I just talked to Stuart Varney about. So it's 180,000 US jobs, $70 billion of uh, additional GDP growth. It's a really big deal. In fact, Canada and Mexico combined are twice as large as China, by the way. So you stack rank these four important trading partners here. We got Japan off the table. We really have Canada and, and Mexico ready to go if Speaker Pelosi will move forward with the USMCA in the House. We've got the votes in the House, we've got the votes in the Senate, and the President's ready to sign it. And the last part of this, this puzzle is China, and I'm cautiously optimistic we'll see something here before the end of the year, kind of a phase one deal that the President Lighthizer are working on that would uh, give us some more momentum here as we're going into, uh, into next year. So I want to thank you for your support. And again, Chris and Brian, um, and what you all do here, you were most helpful to me personally as we were working through the, uh, the quantitative argument to ensure that we, we got rates cut on the, on the pass-through side. And I'd be happy to open any questions you have here um, a few minutes before. I've got to go do a vote, I think, right now. But I serve in the Finance Committee. I'm on Appropriations, Energy, and Natural Resources, and Indian Affairs on my committees. And 
I'm sure a couple of those committees probably are of interest to you. Brian. Yeah. So the question is, uh, during the presidential debates, the Democrat debates, they're talking about wealth tax, is that coming up? I'll tell you what's coming up with most Montanans, is just how shocked they are, how far to the left the Democrats are who are running for president, where they're going right now. If you close your eyes and listen to the Democrat presidential debate, you might wonder if you were listening to the city council debate in Berkeley. It's, it's, these are radical ideas. I was having a conversation with Charles Schwab, listening to him as he talked about his new book called Invested that came out. Story of Schwab from when they took really stocks from Wall Street to Main Street so the common men and women could, could now own stocks. It was kind of their vision. And we kind of, the, the discussion came up, what happens if they get, take charge of this place? What happens if Elizabeth Warren is president of the United States? I mean, besides day one, she bans fracking. And then after that, starts going after tax, raising taxes. And what that would do to the equity markets, you think about, we're up 65, 70% since 2014. Think what that's doing to um, the Dow. Is. Think what it does right now to your 401ks. The average man and woman in this country is looking at that and they're saying, man, this has been wonderful. Think of the shock that would have to the equity markets, this economy if they take charge of this place. So I, it concerns me greatly, and generally it's not just the, the tax increases that they're talking about, but just frankly all the rhetoric is chilling to many who I present, represent back in Montana. Elections have real consequences. This is a really, really big deal coming up in November 20. Yeah. Right, so the questions on extenders during the year. We just had a good meeting with Chuck Grassley. He pulled together the Republican senators for a little round table in his office uh, a couple of days ago looking at this. You know, we've got a number of things we've got to get fixed. We've got to get the technical fixes on the, on the bill uh, from 2017. We've got to deal with these, the tax extenders as well. Um, unfortunately, the request from our friends across the aisle, they're, they're, uh, they're, the give get there is so out of proportion for where it should be, that right now we're at a stalemate. I think the consensus from the finance committee is we're not going to be held hostage to a $400 billion increase because whether it's electric vehicle uh, credits or child earned income credits. Um, it's bad policy. And uh, we're, so we're, we're a bit of a loggerheads at the moment. So more to come on that, but at the moment we aren't, uh, we're not taking that, uh, that bait. We're going to hold firm on that, but we recognize we need to, we need to get some of these tax policies, uh, some of these extenders here, um, we've got to put some certainty to them, and we need to get these technical fixes, you know, particularly the quip fix is one that we've got to get fixed. I and mean, there's a couple more as well. Yes? Yeah. 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 It will. The election of 2020. I wish I had a better answer for you right now, but uh, if if the power shifts in 20, that's going to be a pretty pretty uh, difficult lift. So I think that's the first thing to focus on here. But I think we want to, what we're doing here is getting that out in front, of folks. Now, as you said, you know, you just got to keep keep charging that hill, and to keep that in front of people. Um, it's be highly unlikely if anything gets done between now and, uh, and the election on that particular piece of legislation to put in permanency on the, um, the pass-through side, the tax cuts. Uh, but I think the election will be very, very important. If we can get, get some uh, adult supervision back in the House, make sure we keep the majorities in the Senate and re-elect President Trump, um, I'd, be, uh, I'd be more optimistic. Thank you, Senator. All right, thank you. You bet. Thank you so much. Thank you. We thank the senator. He's got a vote, a vote that's been called, and uh, appreciate him spending so much time with us today and sharing his insights. So now we're going to um, we're going to move to uh, our uh, our, pres our presenters, our experts, our panel of experts. I'm going to um, I'm going to introduce all of them, and then they'll each give their individual uh, presentations.
but um, these are folks who've done a deep dive on the topics that the senator, um, senator outlined. Um, we've got on our panel uh, Bob Carroll from EY. Uh, he's going to be uh, unveiling a new study with uh, a lot of detail, granular details on the actual impact on, on effective tax rates of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act across all the, the sectors uh, in the business community. And uh, we, we really love working with EY. They, they really are the gold standard in our town, uh, other than the Joint Committee on, uh, on Tax Analysis. Then we have David Winston of the Winston Group, um, who's just one of the best, uh, the best in the business on uh, putting his finger on the pulse of public opinion and, uh, and calling it like he, like, like he sees it. And um, we're gonna get some really interesting uh, insights on the human dynamic of where the public, where voters are on these questions. And then um, Brian Reardon, my colleague from the S Corp Association, uh, is the, um, runs the S Corp Association, but also is the chair of the parity uh, uh, group, uh, chair of the uh, steering committee. And then finally, um, our ringleader, the, uh, the dean of the delegation, as I would say, of the Washington uh, tax writing community, uh, Marty Sullivan uh, from Tax Notes. Um, I, I would call him a, a true raconteur of tax policy. And that is not an oxymoron when, when referring to Marty. Uh, an entertaining, uh, delightful guy and always, always asks uh, insightful questions that push the envelope and we're gonna turn them loose on our panel. Our first presenter, is going to be uh, Bob Carroll. Take it. Oh, great, thank you. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for that very uh, uh, generous and kind introduction, Chris. I, I would say that people in my firm do not object to uh, EY being called the gold standard <laughs> and, and being compared in such a laudable way with the Joint Committee on Taxation, and, and they, they are the gold standard, and we're happy to be right behind them. <laughs> so I appreciate that, really do appreciate that. Um, so I'm just gonna spend about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, 10 or 12 minutes talking about the study that um, the S Corporation Association is releasing today that we prepared on behalf of them. The study uh, looks at really two, two things. It, it, it presents some um, uh, economic data on the, um, the footprint, the economic front, footprint of the pass-through sector with a little granularity around uh, S corporations and large S corporations. And then we also um, take a look at the impact of the TCJA, um, uh, Senator Daines uh, spoke a great deal about his involvement and, and leadership in that area uh, with respect to pastors. But we'll be looking at the impact of the TCJA on the tax burden on, on C corporations versus pass-throughs with a, with a focus on, on large S corporations. And, and that's a, a major part of this. Um, where we look at that, and just to, to preface where I'm gonna go, we, uh, we look at two uh, metrics, if you will, effective tax rates or average tax rates and marginal effective tax rates. Um, we look at them at three points in time uh, before enactment of the TC TCJA, in a couple of years after enactment of the TCJA, and then in 2026 and, and, and beyond after the sunset of, of most of the major individual provisions, uh, notably the Section 199, um, uh, deduction uh, that's so important to the, the pass-through community. Um, you know, we're looking at all the kind of the major provisions that TCJA changed that impact S and C corporations. We're looking at, of course, the lower corporate tax rate. We're looking at the uh, lower top individual tax rates. I mentioned the uh, Section 199 cafe deduction, uh, the SALT, uh, the limitation on the SALT deduction and um, the sunsetting of, of some of the other, other, other individual provisions. Um, um, those are the major ones, and some of the calculations were including the effects of uh, um, uh, expensing, and that, that, of course, sunsets towards the end of the budget window. Um, just to preface kind of w what we find, um, what we find is this table presents kind of the key results from the report, 
effective tax rates, marginal, fact, uh, marginal effective tax rates. I'll call them eaters and meters. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll move to that shorthand. It's a little easier uh, on the tongue. Um, large S corporations. And we, we compare the large S corporations to closely held um, uh, C corporations where their, tax, tax, their shareholders are fully taxable as kind of a, a proxy for if a large S corporation were to become a C corporation, what would their tax situation look like? And so that gives kind of that comparison. And then we compare the large S corporations to uh, the average uh, C corporation, which um, uh, then uh, allows where you assume that the shareholders of that average C corporation kind of follow the average, um, uh, average share of tax exempt shareholders and, and the uh, average share of dividend payout for the closely hold, uh, not, not to get into all the details, but the, the point of that comparison to the average C corporation is that's kind of who we think the S corp large S corporations would be competing against. So it's another very relevant uh, comparison. So those, again, looking at two different uh, kind of margins or scenarios. Then we look at marginal effective tax rates. Marginal effective tax rates are, are forward-looking. They are looking at the kind of the tax bite on a new investment. Um, they are often used to evaluate kind of the effect of tax policy changes on investment incentives. If you were sitting at the Joint Committee on Taxation or Treasury or CBO, uh, in, uh, Council of Economic Advisors, any of these places, they're going to be looking, if they're thinking about investment incentives, they'll be looking at marginal effective tax rates. But they're looking at the tax burden on new investment going forward, um, a kind of a different measure. But another important um, measure to look at when considering um, uh, how the TCJ affected S and the relative advantage of activity in, in the, uh, uh, through the S corporation forum or the C corporation forum. What we find, as this table indicates, is for large S corporations, they, they had a tax treatment that looks you know, largely similar before the, uh, the TCJA. It looks largely similar um, uh, after uh, the first few years after the TCJA in 2019 is we're looking at 2019 law. Why 2019? Well, it's, it's this year. But it, it's the same as 2018 and 2020 in terms of that. that. But, um, you know, so that's that. And 2026 is when most of the individual provisions have sunset, but for there's still 20% of expensing left. Um, but in any case, the, the bottom line result here is it looks pretty similar before the TCJA looks um, pretty similar, but a little bit higher for large S corps uh, after the uh, TCJA, um, primarily due to the 21% rate and, you know, and so on. And then after, after the sunset of 199, things changed dramatically, and large S corporations would face significantly higher effective and marginal tax rates than, than, than kind of comparable or, or uh, similarly situated um, uh, C, C corporations. So that's kind of the key result. Then I'm going to kind of talk through the economic footprint statistics, come back to the eater and meter calculations, and then, then wrap up. So, um, this, is, this, this slide shows kind of just the rapid growth of, uh, we all know that S corporations have grown rapidly over time, particularly around the, uh, the 86 Act when, the, when the, the relationship of the rates flipped uh, and you had the individual rates coming way down. And you also had um, check the box and, and a, greater, um, a greater ease at which companies could um, um, take advantage or, or, or organize as corporations from a tax perspective in, in the 90s. And so you had this rapid rise. Um, and, and it's important to kind of, when you're looking at the, 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 the footprint of, this, of the uh, pass-through sector, it is important to not just account the firms, because um, there are a lot of very small um, sole proprietors that are often included in these calculations. And so it's important to look at the underlying economic activity as represented by net income and gross receipts and so on. So you have the 95% of business entities are, are pass-throughs. We have 50% of net income. That's a really big number. Uh, half of business net income is, is in the pass-through form and 37% of gross receipts. I should point out that these numbers include partnerships, and, and there's a, as the footnote indicates, 
uh, a significant share of that part, those partnerships are run by C Corp. So it's, it's, this is not an apples to apples comparison. Um, you know, it's not, not super clean, but it gives the, I think it leaves one with the impression that um, there's a lot of concentration of economic activity in the pass through sector. Um, then we looked at employment, um, and we have 58% of private sector workers are working for pass through businesses. If we had one, one or two key results from the economic footprint part of the study, this would, I think, be one of them. Um, in terms of S Corps, 35 million are employed by S Corporations. That's 26%, a little more than a quarter of all private sector workers. And for large S Corporations, which here we define as those with more than 100 employees, they employed 13 million, 10% of private sector workers in 2016. Should point out that these statistics 2014, 2016 are before the TCJA, and so they don't yet reflect the, the effects of the TCJA, and there might could be some, to the extent the TCJA shifts incentives, there might be some, some changes to this. But this, again, reinforces the view that, you know, that these guys, a lot of economic activity is being channeled through the pass-through form in this, this country. And then the, the next, next uh, this chart is, uh, is one, one of my favorite charts, Brian. Um, it, 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 it took a lot of time to put together. But, but um, what's interesting and what's kind of cool about this chart is it uh, doesn't suffer from the problem of having all those partnerships owned by C-Corps in it. This is looking at the taxes paid by individual owners uh, on their pass-through income and is able to isolate the individual owner owners of pass-through income. And, and the, you know, if we had a second top line result from our um, uh, footprint section of the study, it's you know, more than half, 51% of, we find more than half, 51% of business taxes are paid by pass-throughs. S corporations are 20% of the total. Um, so we're looking at S partnerships, sole props, um, and, um, and also including the uh, tax on the capital gains that are paid on uh, through pass-through activity. On the, on the corporate side, we're including both the entity level tax paid at the corporate level, a uh, corporate income taxes, um, that's the 205, and we include the shareholder level taxes in the, you know, that are being paid on, on corporate earnings uh, paid out to or distributed to shareholders as dividends or, or retained and eventually taxed as capital gains on corporate equities. And so this is, um, again, reinforces the view that a lot of activity channeled through the pass-through form, and this kind of controls for that very important limitation of the earlier data that a lot of partnerships, you know, Pixar, Disney, there are a lot of partnerships that are kind of uh, owned by, by corporations, um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, in terms of the com comparison of C versus S, again, two measures, the eaters and the meters, effective tax rates, marginal effective tax rates, the effective tax rate, you can think of it as an average tax rate, um, all evaluated at, at kind of the, the upper rates, uh, particularly for C corporations at a 20% rate, for the large S corporation at the 37% rate that's in place today. Uh, it's useful comparing the relative burden for existing operations. Um, it's, it's, you know, companies will often make choices based on uh, ETR calculations. The marginal effective tax rate, again, is a forward-looking calculation. It's looking at the tax on an incremental, the, the additional incremental uh, income from a new investment, forward-looking, useful for looking at um, evaluating investment incentives as the tax system gets changed over time, often used in the kind of the government space uh, for evaluating um, you know, tax policy changes. Um, we present a number of different um, we make a number of different comparisons. I've kind of kind of alluded to a lot of this already. We look at our large S corporations. We look at at um, uh, all pass through business owners, the closely held uh, C corporation with fully taxable shareholders. Uh, the closely held C corporation is assuming 20, 22 percent of corporate earnings are paid out as dividends. Then we have an average C corporation, which is assuming 44 percent of corporate earnings are paid out as dividends. That 44% is the average. Um, it's, it comes from a CBO study. Um, we're, we're taking account of the, 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 uh, the, the 199 cap A deduction in the pass-through and S-corp calculations. We're assuming that 75% um, of uh, pass-through income uh, is able to take advantage of that. That's based on, on a CBO analysis. 
Um, um, and so that, that again, is, 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 is some of those assumptions are rather important. Um, and, and again, we have close, we have the, um, the uh, large S corp is viewed as kind of a closer subs, uh, a close subs, substitute with the average, uh, with the closely held C corporations, how they would be taxed if they organize as a C. And then we have the, the, the competitors, um, the, the competition, the viewing kind of the large S corps as competing against the average C corp as kind of the right comparison. Um, the pass through in the large S corp, the major difference is the, uh, we're, we're uh, taking into account kind of the ride up the graduated rate schedule by kind of all the, the all, all for, for the pastors generally, whereas the large S corps, as I mentioned, are subject to, we assume are subject to the top 37% rate today, 39.6 uh, prior to CCJA and in 2026. Those are the key assumptions. So again, we have kind of this basic result where we have um, a pretty much parity between large S corps and and uh, the C corps before TCJA, um, it, it, that kind of that that is kind of maintained after TCJA in the first few years after enactment. Um, the large S corp rate is a little bit higher. The pass through rate for uh, it, for all pass throughs is a little bit a little bit lower. And then when you have repeal of the Section 199 Cap A, then the the differences are dramatic, very very significant differences. The meter calculations kind of are very, very similar the, um, and, and kind of tell a similar story, uh, kind of parity before TCJA for the large uh, S-Corps parity after, um, you know, largely, you know, generally speaking, and then we have, um, we have uh, you know, very, very significant differences uh, after. And some limitations, these are these limitations and caveats are, are in the report in greater detail. So uh, I'll leave it there. Very good. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we're going to go some re go through some research. One of the, the, the questions that Brian posed to me was like, can anybody actually grasp this concept of what is a pass-through and how does that work and how does that sort of fit in the broader frame of things? Um, and so with that, we, we uh, did uh, two focus groups um, with the probably what is defined now as the sort of two of the key central groups in terms of thinking through elections, women who actually the majority of the country is just being a voter group. Um, and independence, and so we talked to those two um, groups down in Orlando, and then we followed that up with the national survey of the thousand registered voters. So I want to start off with just a general sense of how people per perceive the private sector. And in this survey, what you see is about 60% had a favorable view of the private sector, 20% unfavorable, three to one ratio, which is, which is a good ratio. It's, that 59%, I would argue, should be higher, um, but nonetheless is starting from a good point. Um, so how does, how did, a person describe their view of the private sector, and part of what we're going to do here is I'm going to give you, so you can hear how people actually describe this as opposed to my interpretation of it. So here's a woman, sort of her interpretation of where the private sector is. I would say private sector is more of a positive thing because they don't have the constraint <clears throat> that government does. They can, you know, they can work more independently and they don't have to, you know, they can listen to more of what the consumer needs. Then. And that's the ultimate strength in terms of what we found in terms of the private sector. The sense is here are consumer needs, here's the needs I have, and the private sector meets those, right? And that's viewed as a real strength. Um, and it's a real sense in terms of what that connection is, why people want it. Having said that, there are challenges that have also emerged in terms of the private sector. Um, and here's somebody describing that. Well, I think capitalism is great if you're the country. If you're a country, capitalism is great. If you're an individual, it could be a little more difficult to call it great. Right. So with that as a, a construct, the idea of individual versus the country at large, we actually tested that. And what you see is millennial Gen Z agree with that by an overwhelming margin, 65 to 17. If you're 39 plus, you're not as sure. You're, you're neutral, slightly, uh, slightly disagree. So it's this concept of sort of the challenge to individuals in terms of what the current economic system does in the private sector. And what sort of leads to that? Well, one, um, the idea that, and we did these as belief statements, do you believe or not believe this statement? Someone who wants to start up their own business will have a hard time competing with large corporations. You see almost three quarters of the country agrees with that. 
right? So it's the sense of, of how difficult is it for an individual to do that. Um, and then you look at it, excessive taxes on businesses make it difficult for the average Americans to start their own businesses, 64% believe that. So what you see is basically the concept of big, big government, big business, making it very difficult in terms of the, an individual to sort of enter um, the private sector and create their own business. So the challenge here is obviously how to create a growing private sector using, um, as was described earlier, the idea that, that as Senator Danes described, the amount of jobs being created by pass-throughs. Um, so how do people sort of see this difference between large public corporations and privately owned businesses? And here's a woman sort of describing that. I think some of them sometimes get too big for their britches and they don't, um, they lose their intent. They lose their intent. What do you mean by that? I think sometimes you can get so big that you forget your focus on the reason why you're, mm -hmm. you have a corporation. And that's a really critical construct here. So the idea, and she went through this really interesting description of another, uh, another business who um, she was aware of who the person was who sort of came up with the original idea and walked through it and then said, but that person passed away and it sort of turned into a corporation and that company lost their intent because they didn't have that original person. Right, who was really driving the creativity and all that. And, and in her mind, and I would suggest what, what we saw in other groups, that was an important moment, right? That individual being able to drive that intent, and that intent basically was meeting a consumer demand, consumer need, right? And so it was a really interesting contrast. And so how does somebody, how does somebody see that, that this, what her definition of the challenge in terms of a large corporation, how did they see potentially pass through smaller businesses address that? The difference is, is that the pass-through is owned by a person and they have complete control and autonomy over whatever happens with the company. Whereas with a corporation, you've got a board of directors and so on. And to some degree, what, he, what he's defining in terms of that first is, is because they control the direction, they have the authority, they can sustain that intent because it was their idea and they're driving it. Um, it, was a really, it was a really interesting contrast. Um, so in terms of large public corporations and taxes, um, just people's sense in terms of what the difference is in terms of how the two uh, entities sort of handle their tax situation? Actually, the larger corporations probably pay very little in taxes. They have way too many accountants that can find loopholes and everything. Whereas the mom and pops go to H&R Block or whoever mm -hmm. and end up having to pay a maximum. Right, and so with that, um, we went back and we wanted to sort of quantify how do people sort of view that. So we asked people, um, in terms of these entities, um, what tax rate do you think um, they are paying? And they could put anywhere from zero to 100 in terms of this. And so, so what you see here is um, the largest, the people who they think are paying the most are family-owned businesses and small businesses are viewed as, as paying the most at, at, at uh, 21 to 22 percent. Um, the least are wealthy individuals and public corporations um, at 19 and 18. Um, one, one thing in terms of always asking this question, what people think the rates are and what they would like them to be are always significantly lower than what they actually are. There's not an understanding, uh, or there's not a clear sense of like the idea somehow that somebody's paying 40%. Um, people just don't see that at all. Um, and you'll see on, the, on this next slide, because when you get to looking at what's the maximum rate people should pay, and my guess is most, most of these entities would be sort of generally pretty happy with those. Um, if you take a look here, you see, however, th that it inverts. Rather than wealthy and individuals they think are paying the lowest, they think they should be paying the highest. But again, you're looking at 31% and 23%. And then looking at family-owned businesses and small businesses, those go to the bottom um, at, at 16 to 17%. Um, so why this, what's the belief system sort of behind that? Um, one, um, basically you see by an overwhelming margin, people think it's unfair to tax the same business net income twice. 77% agree with that. Um, and two, when you see certain businesses become successful um, that are passed through, people think that that's, that is not an unreasonable extension. Um, by over a two to one margin, once established pass through businesses should be able to grow without restriction and be taxed on their net income. There's a sense, well, again, it's because you have that individual with that initial intent, um, in fact, driving um, that particular business and they view that as a very positive thing. But this gets back to the original question that Brian posed to me is that can people grasp the concept? And so let me just sort of set up the dynamic in terms because I'm going to, you're going to see some people describing it. 
what I did was about halfway, the focus groups last for about two hours, so about almost halfway through it, um, and, and you set it up in such a way so that you can have a conversation, but you don't want to sort of pollute it in terms of giving them all sorts of information so you can sort of can't really grasp what they're thinking. But about halfway through, given the nature of this, we had to sort of lay out, and I did a very brief definition in terms of, of what a pass-through was. Um, and then this is at the very end. So I did that, we had some other conversation at the end, I decided to come back an hour later and see what they managed to retain out of that specific definition, and here's what we got. And I, and, and I went around the entire room, I'm just highlighting two people, but basically this is representative in terms of, of, all, of both groups, um, how people could define this. What I'm going to ask you to do is we go through, describe to me what that passed through as far how, <laughs> from what I've described, you think it works. Um, you get, you get <laughs> okay. And as far um, uh, at the end of the year, their profits are split up in between the owners, and they pay personal taxes on that after the expenses. And, and why do you think that's, that, that's good or fair? That's fair because they're only taxed on the profit, and they're only taxed one time. Each The, the entire income, is the entire profit is taxed one time. Between them. Let's pick, no, Cheryl. So at the end of the year, whatever income the business generated minus paying employees and expenses, get that profit gets divided up between the owners and they pay personal income tax on that. Right. Actually, that bad description is given that an hour ago, that before that, they had just heard it for the first time. By the way, just so you know, on the first person, the reason I said, why do you think that's fair? Because she had stated that just before, and I had cut that out. So, so I, I wasn't leading her, okay, I promise. Um, but, but you can see that actually there was a relatively decent grasp of, in fact, what it does. And, and, it, and the point of that is, given the challenge in terms of being able to lay this ar argument out, is it doable? The answer is yes. So in looking forward here, um, what is the dynamic in terms of how people view passwords? One, they, they sort of view them as being more responsive to the consumer. I mean, that's how they, the business got started initially. Um, and as they continue, they don't lose the intent because you have the original person there sort of driving that. They view them as should being able to grow because obviously if they're meeting consumer demand, there's obviously the sense there's demand there to sort of increase the amount of product being sold. However, they also see the challenge of starting businesses up against both the concept of, of big, large corporations and big government. But ultimately, at the end, they see the opportunity in sort of using the structure to help grow the private sector, and that allows them to be more, that allows the private sector to be more responsive to public demands um, in terms of products, needs, et cetera. So with that, let's go ahead and go on to the panel. It's a real pleasure for me to be moderating this panel because what you have today is a very compact and concise combination of facts, I love facts, from Bob and the political reality from David. So you're getting both at the same time. And don't forget to grab, where's your, nobody, what's in the lunch baskets? Nobody's eating it. <laughs> Nobody's hungry, okay. But anyway, it's, it's, I, I, I've learned a lot from both of these papers. It's a great combination, and I highly recommend that you look at them. One fact, one thing that we learned from David's analysis with the focus group is a little bit of education goes a long way if you're trying to understand the pass-through sector. It's uh, not obvious in other countries. We don't have large pass-through sectors. In the United States, we didn't have a large pass-through sector, really, until the uh, 1986 Act. Um, and it's very heartwarming to find out, uh, the reason a little education goes a long way is that the S-corporation way is the right way. Pass-through taxation is the proper way to do things. Double taxation is a very bad thing. The we nerdy economists will argue that all day long. And it's nice to know that the regular folks think the same thing too. So let me just move, we don't have a lot of time, but let me just go, I have so many questions, um, but let me just go right to the, perhaps the headline right now, which is wealth taxation, or more, more generally taxing the wealth, and it's a question for all of you, so you can all join in. Um, we see that uh, 
I think it's correct to say, David, from your study that there is a inclination for people. They won't, they're not afraid to tax wealth. The, the odds are on that side. Maybe in Montana that's not the case, but more generally it, it, it probably is. Or at least it's growing, and that's, that, I think that's a political reality. We all can see it. Bernie and Elizabeth Warren are proposing a wealth tax, which is grabbing all the head headlines. Saez and Guzman have a new book out. I actually read it. I never read books, but I did read that one. Um, and it had a lot of problems, but it also had a lot of provocative uh, ideas and what, for whatever it is having impact on the political situation. Now, for a lot of administrative, political, and constitutional reasons, I don't think we're ever gonna have a wealth tax in the United States, so I'm not gonna get all excited about it myself. Personally, I could be wrong, y'all could disagree with me, but the sentiments behind what is driving the wealth tax are not gonna go away anytime soon. There is a more and more a willingness to tax the rich and I think it's very important, I've been saying this for a year, nobody paying attention to me, there's a big difference between the merely rich, a couple million dollars, versus the super rich with tens of billions of dollars. And I think that's, uh, with the Joint Committee breaking out more data like that, the SOI bringing out more data like that, the Federal Reserve breaking out more data, and the good old For Forbes 400 making this apparent, um, this is probably not gonna go away. So my question for y'all, is there are other ways of taxing wealth besides a wealth tax, and there's two general categories. One is to go after capital gains taxation a little more aggressively, and you could do that in, I'll suggest, three ways. Higher rates, right now it's 20% plus 3.8%. Um, we can go back to that. We could uh, follow the Wyden proposal of ca taxing on an accrual basis, or, and I think this is the most realistic of them all, is to get rid of the tax-free step-up in basis at death. So these would be other options. Uh, the other way to go after wealthy, or super wealthy if you target it properly, is to bring back, <laughs> or bring, reinvigorate the estate tax, which is certainly swimming against the long-term political tide, but it is exactly what a wealth tax is trying to do. So, and the way you would do that is you could raise the rates, you could have a graduated estate tax structure, or you can close the loopholes that were identified by the uh, Obama administration in its last budget, including most prominently the valuation discount for family limited partnerships. So, what do you think? Do you think this is just all gonna go away after President Trump is reelected? Uh, even if President Warren, you know, there is a President Warren uh, or President Biden or President Bernie afterwards, uh, where do you think this might be going? Anybody? I just make a couple of observations, and uh, yeah, and obviously not. I'm not going to comment on the the politics of this. Um, it's a hot issue in the presidential election, of course, and the word you use, provocative. It's it is is. Uh, raised in a provocative way, it's written about in a provocative way, and, and it, it, there's a lot of issues around it, um, and the wealth tax is kind of emblematic of those very, very broad set of issues relating to wealth and income inequality, of which there are, as you point out, a number of levers. Um, but just one, maybe just a couple of observations that um, you know, uh, a lot of our European counterparts have had wealth taxes and they have in the last decade or two, last decade or so, last five or 10 years uh, is probably more accurate, have tended to move away from those Absolutely. wealth taxes. They're, they're not easy to administer. Like all taxes, they're complicated, and they're complicated issues that are specific to trying to tax wealth. One thing to keep in mind, the difference between an estate tax and a wealth tax is a wealth tax, as it's been described in the proposals put forward, is it's an annual tax on wealth. Um, and whereas an estate tax is a tax on one's wealth after you die on your estate. And that is very, very different in yeah. terms of its impact, its cumulative impact on, on capital accumulation, and that, that would be a, a significant a poli policy concern. And then the only other thing I would mention is, uh, just because I, I used to work at the Treasury Department as an economist, uh, I used to be in the Bush administration as an economist,
and this isn't really related to the Bush administration, although I used to work in capital gains revenue estimates, and I just happen to know <laughs> that um, if you do the math, given the behavioral responses to capital gains, the revenue maximizing rate on capital gains is, is thought to be in the, let's say, broadly speaking, between 25 and 30 percent, probably around between 26 and 28 percent. And when the rate gets above that level, it's, it's, it's a little hard to raise much yeah. revenue. And so that's a big, um, always, has always been kind of a, a constraint on the ability to raise capital gains rates very high. And if you were doing so, it wouldn't be for revenue, it'd be for other reasons, distributional or, or some other reason. And so with that, I'll... No, it, yeah. I just, um, I agree with that. I think raising the capital gains rate is problematic for just the reason you raised. The uh, uh, annual valuations is a nightmare to think about, especially when they go down. <laughs> but the, uh, but the, uh, on the other hand, the capital gains at death, I think, is the most viable. Uh, uh, repealing the tax-free step-up and basis at death is the most viable of these alternatives. I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. Well, I'm, I'm going to do this in, in two pieces. Um, one, giving you a sense of what people expect out of the private sector as, as, as we look at things. But I also want to start off with I have, I have a clear viewpoint. I, I was Newt's director of planning when he was speaker. Um, and people tend to forget that um, in 1997, in August, we passed a $400 billion tax cut, which is really the, the original Jack Kemp thought in terms of looking at cap gains and how do you create investment. Um, and everybody said, well, this is going to just blow a hole in the budget, and we bounced the budget the next year. Um, and the reason for that, and, 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 and this is sort of the idea in terms of it's what's going to handle things, it's economic growth. How do you generate the economic growth? And that's basically what happened. And we were hitting a huge, I mean, we were hitting 4% there at the end of the decade. We had unemployment drop at a scale. Um, we were actually were running surpluses. I mean, it was, I mean, think about it. We ran it one, one year a quarter of a billion dollar surplus. I mean, that's sort of like almost mind-boggling at this point. These young people don't understand yeah. that. So, 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 um, so I, I start with it. But, but here, here are the three expectations in terms of what people have in terms of the private sector, to your point, and, and, and this is what they're looking for. One, um, the, the, the private sector provides the economic infrastructure to individual families who have to run their own economies every day. Okay, how are we meeting that and how are you dealing with that? Well, economic growth is the best way to increase those wages to make that happen. Two, um, they're looking to the private sector to meet critical economic demands. And I think you generally see that in terms of, you know, as products get introduced, the products drop, as people get better at producing them, and, and so there's a way for them to sort of incorporate that. So as long as they're meeting those demands, and I would suggest we sometimes see some dissonance there where um, you don't see the appropriate drop in terms of prices or, or the effectiveness in terms of meeting those demands. Um, and companies, as that woman said, uh, tend to lose their intent and drift in other directions. And then the third aspect is the purpose of the private sector to a large degree, and what it does is it provides the resources to uh, pr appropriately define the level of government and, and fund it. The reason I say that is that's not me speaking. That's the electorate. One of the things that over the years, the electorate is a lot smarter than people want to give them credit for. Um, they really do have a, a pretty clear understanding. They may not have the technical terms down particularly well, um, but they understand what things should be occurring and how those things should be developing. Typically, okay, and this is going to be harsh for, not this group, but when you, I'm sure people can think about this. Typically what happens is people get frustrated. Well, the electorate doesn't understand my problem. Well, that's because your problem may not be particularly compelling to them, and so they're just not going to waste the time because they've got lots of other things to do. Don't misinterpret that versus in terms of their basic understanding of things. So, so that's, that's sort of my, my, my sense of it. What they're looking for is a growing economy that's going to increase wages and create jobs. There you go. Well said. So um, just, just to add to what Bob and, and David have said, um, you know, I, th I think two things we learned from, from David in his work is one, voters really dislike, they don't think it's fair to have multiple layers of tax on the same income, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the wealth tax is, represents yet another layer of tax on the same income, right? It's the third layer, effectively, or maybe even the fourth. So right there, it fails David's survey and the, the work that he did. The second thing we learned from David is that voters have very reasonable thoughts about what the top rate should be. And this is something that's bothered me for a long, long time, is that you see these polls where people are saying, yes, 60, 70 percent of people want to raise taxes on the rich. But then you ask, well, you know, what's the top rate for the wealthy? You know, what's the most they should pay? And what you saw from David's work is the average response was 30 percent. 
the top responses, you know, I think, you know, if you went from 95% of all the respondents, I think it was below 40%. Mm -hmm. So people are very, very reasonable about what they think the top rate should be. Yet when you look at what's being proposed on the wealth taxes, you know, Elizabeth Warren says, well, it's just two cents. Well, no, no, it's 2% of whatever return you have on your investment. So if you have a family business that returns 6% per year, that's a 33% tax rate. And it's not just by itself, it's a 33% tax rate on top of the 30, or what Bob came up with, which is right around 33% effective rate that's being paid by the income tax. And then you have to account for the estate tax because every generation these businesses have to buy a portion of their company back from the federal government. So you add that in there, you add it all up and you're talking rates of 60, 70, 80% on the family businesses. And what we just learned from David is, Voters aren't there. They don't think that that's fair. There's a, what I always find fascinating about tax policy is we get tied up in the numbers and everything, and we miss the point where Americans have a very strong sense of what's fair and what's not fair. And what they think is fair is you tax income, you tax it once, you tax it at a reasonable rate, yeah. and then you let it go. And that's the way S-Corps are taxed. That's why Marty and I and a bunch of other people agree that S-Corps are the way that businesses should be taxed, and we're going to continue with that mantra until the policymakers get it. You know, and Brian's point, you know, you made the point I never quite thought about it before, which is uh, we're going to have a whole new tax system, this wealth tax system. Well, obviously, we can't leave the estate tax system, or if we do, that would be ridiculous. We'd probably have to get rid of the estate tax at the same time we put on a new tax, which seems a pretty complicated and strange thing to do since they both sort of do the same things. Anyway, yeah. do we have... Um, I'm going to ask one more quick question, and we'll take audience questions. Yeah, we've got time. Okay. Got time? Please, go get something to eat. It's the Italian in me. Eat. Come on. <laughs> All right. I'm trying. Uh, this, Isn't your last name Sullivan? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to do that. <laughs> um, I want to relate again David's and Bob's work. Um, uh, I think one other thing, the major theme that came out of David's work was that uh, there's some antipathy to large corporations. This is not exclusive to the United States. It's manifest itself in the OECD base erosion and profit shifting project. It manifests itself in all types of uh, anti-base erosion rules around the world. And then there's not, it's not just tax. I'm sure somewhere on this Capitol Hill, Facebook is getting a, an earful. So uh, big business is not doing too well in the public relations category now. And um, um, so strategically for pass-through businesses, I think I, I asked Brian this, really you don't want to get caught up in that we're all, business is all one and the same. And what you get from David's work is there is a very clear differentiation by the public between those big corporations that could hire big accounting firms to uh, minimize their taxes while the small uh, pass-through entities have trouble uh, just uh, forget about tax planning, just keeping up with uh, doing their due diligence. So um, uh, this differential in perceptions and differential in taxation between the two groups now, one thing you left out of your study, and because E and Y is the gold standard, and they just don't have enough business, I thought that uh, uh, something else that could be done, which would be very complicated and costly, uh, would be. Uh, and, and by the way, it is in this. It's it's in the less advertised part of the uh, Saez and Zuckman book that multinational corporations in local markets are able to compete better than the local firms. They have advantages. And that makes sense to me as a tax guy because they can do a lot of profit shifting that a, a, a largely domestic firm cannot do. So I think if you were able to, and it would be very costly and expensive to do it, uh, to figure out what, how much tax saving C corporations get that uh, smaller pass-through entities do not get, would increase that differential between S uh, pass-throughs and, and C corporations. So, so big guys can do big tax planning internationally. Little guys can't. That's right. that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so, um, Bob, any Bob, you want to take that? <laughs>
Yeah, I, I'd say, say a couple things about that. And, see, thank you, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank, you for the, thank you for the comments and the suggestion for additional research and <laughs> additional project. And, costly, um, very costly. Um, yeah, yeah, very costly. Um, but, but in any case, um, you know, um, within the U.S. tax system, there are activities that are taxed at, at, in different ways, at different rates, at different levels of tax, whether, uh, you know, depending on whether you're a tax exempt, whether it's retirement savings, whether you're in the pass-through mm -hmm. sector, whether you're a large S corp, typically subject to the top individual rates, or a, let's say a smaller sole prop subject to the, the lower individual rates, you're a C yeah. corporation uh, subject to a 20% rate, but then a double tax uh, at the shareholder level, but it depends on whether you pay out the, the corporate earnings as dividends or not, and they're, they're subject to different effective rates um, because dividends are taxed as the income is paid out and capital gains is deferred and then might benefit from step up a basis of death. So things are taxed at very, very di in very different ways depending on kind of the shape and size of the business, the activity, kind of what, what the taxpayer, a business or individual is up to. And, and then when you uh, extend that uh, to and bring in other countries, um, you have that, that is multiplied uh, by, um, uh, you, uh, I'm not sure what the factor is, but it's multiplied by a lot. And so countries, some countries have low rates, some countries have high rates, uh, some countries have light rates so that are lower than the U.S. or higher mm -hmm. than the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, it, it varies depending on what industry you're mm -hmm. in. Yeah. If you're mining gold in South Africa, you know, there might be a royalty tax trying to to get at the um, at the underlying uh, minerals mm -hmm. that and yeah. same thing applies to oil. So you have a lot of differential taxation uh, uh, across the globe and and companies that are, are larger and global that operate in these various jurisdictions, perhaps because they're pursuing growth opportunities here or there, um, you know, are, are, are just as taxpayers in this country they respond to all those differentials and, and react to all of that. Yeah, no, it was, it was just yep. very interesting to me how much it came out in David's work, yeah. where regular folks were saying, well, they have all, you know, mm -hmm. they have all these advantages yep. that the little guys don't have. And I just thought that was, and that's true. <laughs> and so, I, again, another, another example of how these regular folks mm -hmm. are actually yeah. hitting but, the nail on the but, head. But a more succinct way of saying what I said is, the reason Senator Danes was, spoke directly about this, one of the reasons there was such a um, uh, overwhelming support in many quarters to lower the corporate rate to 21% was because the U.S. corporate income oh, tax yeah. is very much Absolutely. out of line with the rest of the world. And there was a real sense that it was a significant competitive disadvantage for the U.S. and U.S. companies. And it was affecting um, mm -hmm. where income is loaded, located as well as where mm -hmm. investment was occurring. Yeah. Thank you, Marty. This is Actually, can I, can I just yeah, jump in there? Because I, I do have a, a quick thought, which is, you know, to m one of Marty's questions raises in my mind is, you know, how do you divide up the business community, right? I mean, you know, we've got some friends from the Small Business Administration here, and they've got their definition of small business. And in the tax debates, there's always this notion of, well, you know, these guys are small, these guys are big, we're going to treat them differently. In my mind, the dividing line, and we've talked about this, is between public companies and privately held companies. And that's the dividing line. And you need public companies because there are certain industries out there where you need that huge capital base. You need to be able to access capital markets to get the amount of capital necessary to actually perform what's, what's being needed. Um, on the other hand, for private companies, if you don't have that single layer of tax, you're not going to see as many private companies as you do right now. And the reason is because private companies can't survive under a double tax system competing against public companies that have access to public markets and the capital around the world and all those advantages that you talked about. When it comes to choices, whether you've done any polling um, of voters or, or consumers, when we're looking at extending the tax rates, uh, if you could share whether you have any experience in asking voters if, if you have to choose between a certain expenditure or extending tax rates, what the responses are. 
there are two dynamics to that. One, typically when you say, gee, would you spend more money on education or would you spend money on health care? The answer is, you know, not given a context, sure, right? I mean, because there, there are good public benefits that accrue out of that. The challenge that emerges is when you put it in a real context. Okay, how much are you talking about? So let's go back to the originally the ACA. Um, the idea that people were willing initially to spend a little bit more and, and to be able to bring that many million people into the system, there was like, yeah, I'm not wild about it, but you know, that seems to be. But then it got to be a lot more, and actually their particular quality went down, and so it wasn't, in fact, the, what they thought they were getting. And so part of, part of what you're also seeing from the electorate at this point, this sort of skepticism, we've been told this before, and yet it's cost me a lot, and I have not seen what the return is here. Um, so, um, and, and, what, and as a result of that, and I think you saw this sort of emerge in 2016, it's like I have all these economic challenges in front of me, and who's talking about those? Um, and you saw people willing to take a really significant risk, um, and they understood they were taking a risk. This wasn't they just arbitrarily went. They knew they were doing that um, because there was a sense that the public discourse was not, in fact, meeting their economic concerns. Another question? Yeah, two, two really, really good questions. Um, so, so what we did for the analysis is we assumed, you know, that 75% of the, um, the income for the pass-throughs would, would qualify for the, the deduction. And, and as I mentioned, that follows kind of some data that, some analysis really, that, data, that CBO put out that suggested that that's, that's kind of a, and that, that seemed kind of reasonable to us as well, given kind of um, you know, you know what what we've been seeing, and so so the seventy five percent it was seemed reasonable. We didn't uh, look at we didn't do the the calculations without um, without the one ninety nine at all. In a sense, we have a kind of a weighted average of some in, some out, and it would be relatively easy uh, for us to do that if Brian wanted us to. Um, <laughs> yeah, to you know. Uh, so following up on Marty's suggestion for other, other work. I, this is not a marketing yeah. event, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, uh, it, the, the, the numbers we presented for 2026 kind of are in that world, but other things are changing too, right? And, and the, the one, the limitation on the SALT deduction, um, which is in place prior to that, goes away, but PEAS comes back and the rates go back up. And so there's some, a few other things changing, so it doesn't isolate that. Um, in terms of when the, the data becomes available for to actually see what actually happened, the best data would be the IRS Statistics of Income Division um, tax return data. I think they just released 2016 data, so we're probably a couple years out uh, from, from seeing um, kind of the shift that might have occurred, and, and also, uh, the shift would not have a, would would not be instantaneous, so it might not be until you actually start looking at 2019, 2020 returns that you get a clearer, you know, probably by 2019 you would see a, a good chunk of the shift. But, but yeah. sir, sir, the anti well, Brian could speak to better than this, yeah. better than I can about this, which is there's no mass migration out of the pass-through sector except a few of those private equity firms that were on the borderline mm -hmm. uh, anyway. But that's just anecdotal. We are seeing, we are seeing um, uh, companies convert, 
and uh, we are seeing a lot of companies who decided to put off that decision this year, yeah. see how their taxes resulted, and then they're going to make that decision next year and the ensuing years. Um, one of the interesting things that we've seen is that some of the companies that were considering converting and didn't convert to C were doing so because they weren't really sure that that 21% corporate rate was going to be around long enough, which is ironic since the corporate rate is supposed to be permanent, whereas the deduction for pass-throughs is temporary. They're worried about the flip, which is if I go to C and then they raise the corporate rate, then I'm back where I began, and that's not a good place. And the data is going to trickle in on the, we get the individual data from, SO, from the IRS in the early view in t early 2020, but the S corporation, the corporate, the 1120S data will not come in until yeah. after that, so yeah. we have to kind of wait. And then we need another study. That yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's obviously the theme, but, but clearly right after the act was passed, even before it was passed, companies were, were doing the modeling, running the numbers mm -hmm. to, to make decisions of whether they should stay where they are or, or move. We saw that certainly. Yeah, I don't do that work you know, in, in the firm, but speaking with the, the partners who, who do that work, it's, it's clearly that, that work. It was being done before enactment, being done after uh, enactment continues to be done. And, and companies that were, as kind of, you know, that a lot of companies have been evaluating that would be the right, probably the best way to put it and continue to evaluate it. Okay, we'll take one final question. Uh, you had your hand up, thank you. Now, it, that particular number was generated in terms of that was just a question on a questionnaire. So it was just the wealthy. And so that was their definition. And the wealthy. What's the definition of the wealthy? It's sort of like, what's the definition of the middle class? It's this sense of people, for lack of a better, people who have enough accumulated resources that they don't really have to worry about anything um, at a scale that most people don't understand. Okay, and, 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 and I'm really nebulous about it because truth be told, it varies um, from perspective. If you're somebody who's making 95,000 versus someone who's making 55,000, you have a very, very different view uh, opposed to someone making 100. You just have different views. It, it, it relates to the perspective. Um, the, the concept that was being discussed in terms of what's the appropriate level in terms of the wealthy being taxed, again, what you see is, it's this general sense of there's a point in which how much of your effort doesn't go to you but should go to the government. Um, and what you see, that 30% is, I, that's a repeated number. I mean, if, if you actually go do like a Google search in terms of like other surveys, you'll see somewhere in the neighborhood of like 30, 35, at 35 at the most. Um, now having said that, if I had phrased, how about billionaires, might that have changed that number? Potentially, yeah. Um, but ultimately, the overall concept of most people, when they establish that highest rate, um, is in fact well under what the actual rate is. And again, remember, we're just talking, you know, you're looking at, over, they're, they're thinking of it in terms of overall tax rate. Okay, so you don't even see state and local and all the other. It's just a, what my father used to say about wealthy is if you go into the best hotel in town and you have to ask what the rate is, then you're not wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, let me just build on what David said, which is uh, what I find interesting is that, you know, this, this response has been something that, you know, we've seen in the past. I've seen surveys going back 30 years that came up with the same thing that people are very reasonable. I was just curious if it's still the case given the current political environment. And what I found really interesting is that, you know, whereas the respondents thought 30% was the top that the wealthy should pay. They were thinking, well, they're only paying 20, right? So they're not paying their fair share. And that's where they're, they're not paying their fair share comes from, because they're thinking they only pay 20. When you look at the JCT tables, they're paying 40 or 42. So it really is an education challenge. Yeah. And that's part of what we're doing here, yeah. is yeah. just trying to educate people that, you know, voters are very reasonable. And even if they think the wealthy should pay more, that's because there might be misconstrued on exactly what the wealthy are paying right now. Okay, we'll let that be the last word. Um, thank you all for coming. I appreciate your participation. Uh, I, 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 I